Major support for these broadcasts is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, MNT Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, All Nation Renovation, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Bruce Mosler, Capital One Bank, Cassidy Turley, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orphanides, Centurion Holdings, Chelsea Lighting, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Investors Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates, Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Corman Communities, Madison Realty Capital, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, The Wickoff Group, Urban American, Ackman Ziff Real Estate, Eastern Consolidated, Goldman Properties, The Moynian Group, Muss Development, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Triangle Equities. You know, I want to learn the art of negotiation. And I'm here with a person who says, you can negotiate anything. This man, this book has been published in 37 different languages, was on the New York Times bestseller for 36 weeks. Uh, it's like the legendary book on negotiation. Last week, we gained the insight on the first formative years of Herb Cohn. Today, we're con continuing to tell you how this guy became a master negotiator. Thanks for being here again. So Herb, when we finished last week, we were saying that once again, through the New York Times, which you should be the spokesman for the New York Times, you found a job with Allstate Insurance. Now, first of all, I didn't know you even knew how to drive a car. Maybe it was from the tanker day. You, you, get, a, you get a job at Allstate Insurance as a claims adjuster. What did you know about claims, Nothing. insurance claims? Nothing, because my parents were always overinsured, but remember, they were immigrant, their mentality. My father believed that as a minority, as a Jewish immigrant, wherever he went, he was a resident alien. And so he would never make a claim. He would never make waves. So, so what happens is when you, no, you, you, you're living in Brooklyn, you're still going to law school at NYU, and you get this job, and most claims adjusters were supposed to do four claims a week, maybe, and you do what, 12? 12, 15. These are settled. I would settle all these cases. Right. You settle the cases, and what was more interesting, you settled the cases that you didn't have to go into litigation. You didn't have to go, you know, with payment for medical expenses and all these things. You would just settle the claims. How did you accomplish this as opposed to Sam, Cler Sam other guy over there who was settling only four claims? How did that well, happen? I used to try to think about this stuff and not operate by rote. In other words, what people would do is person A, our insured, strikes person B with their car there's damage to person B's car. So what they would do is get the police report. Our person said, I hit that car. I was at fault. The, re the way they'd handle it was get the police report, go to the scene, take photos, get a signed statement from our insured, see if the other person get a signed thing. If they say they're injured, get a, set up a medical exam, I say, look, 
You owe the money, pay the money. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Ask them what they want. They would want a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollars. Okay, pay them, pay them the money. That was it. So, so what happens is, the the guy who's still going to law school over here, they say, we, you know, we can't keep you as a claims adjuster. We want you to become a supervisor. And so they took you out of Brooklyn, and you now move to Freeport. Yeah, a zone in Freeport. Were you still in law school at this time? Yeah. So you you were like the senior claims adjuster. On a, on well, a, see, w I was settling all these cases. And by the way, I was working 20 hours a week because I'm going to law school. I had to study. So everyone is working 40 hours a week, and they're settling very few cases. They said, tell them what you're doing. So I would have to figure out what I'm doing, explain to them what I'm doing. Then... Uh, they started moving me around from office to office. Then I got this big promotion. They uh, uh, decided that I would head up a, an entire office. And then the office was getting unbelievable results. Because first of all... Now, was that the office in Freeport or the office in New Jersey? At that the office in Kings, at the Kingsway was at... Uh, uh, at uh, Coney Island Avenue and Kings Highway. And uh, it, the, the results are unbelievable. So they brought, they audited. They figured we're overpaying. Turned out we weren't. We were paying less than everybody else. Only we were settling cases. In other words, you owe the money, pay the money. I simplify things. When you, in, insurance is a promise. Okay? You're insured as an accident. You promise to act on his behalf, her behalf, and that's what we did. And so, because that office got tremendous results, they then decided to move me to New Jersey for the whole Eastern Zone, where I would be in charge of training everybody in my new revolutionary theories. You know. So then, how do you end up in the home of Adelaide? The, the city of Adlai Stevenson, Libertyville. <laughs> then they decided to send the Jewish they kid. They're doing so well there. They decide I, that I should go to the home office, which is uh, uh, in uh, North, North Brook, Brook, Illinois, Illinois yeah. overlooking the tollway. I had this great office, by the way. I, I took my father up to show him the office. I was on the sixth floor corner office, really, um, for the first time in my life making money. My father looked around. I had a picture of my wife and children there. And on the door, you know, you could put your name. You slide it in. It said Herb Cohen. He walked over to the door, slid it in and out, and says, yeah, this is your office. In other words, he, <laughs> he didn't believe it. Morris said, my son, he's not doing this. Morris, my son, can't be doing this. That's right. And so so now, you're, now you are teaching for all state claims adjusting. You're, you're teaching them how to, the process and negotiations of the claims adjusting. Now, at that time, all state was owned by Sears. Yeah. And from claims, Sears, the parent company of all state, said, hey, we got this kid over here who knows how to settle claims. Maybe he could be good in human resources. So they send you now to the headquarters of Sears. And what do you do at Sears? Well, I mean, actually was in human resources at Allstate where I complained that there weren't enough women, there weren't any minorities. I was constantly complaining. And people thought that I should be, I was going to get fired. In fact, I once did this presentation for top management and it was always an expense here. I said, we, I got a way to save money. You know my function with the computers? Throw them away. We don't need them. Because the way we promote people has nothing to do with performance here. We promote them by their names. Look, the president's name, Judson, he's the CEO, Judson B. Branch, the president. W. Boyd Christensen, put a little Christ in the company without affecting the way we do business. And then we had the four zone leaders. We had Bob Shepard, okay, he was in the East. 
we had George Powers, strength. And in the South, we had Paul Wilkerson, you know, the blade. And on the West, we had Carl Krieg, you will produce or we take hostages. Now, when I finish this, in other words, and a woman comes in, her name is Gloria Schwartz, put her in a typing pool, you know? You know, uh, 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 Leroy Smith, <laughs> hey, do we have any trucks around here he can maintain? So this was the damn company, we're a bunch of bigots. And I would say things like, I don't mind bigotry. If it made money for us, it's losing money for us. And so people would save my job by saying, he's kidding, it's a joke. And so they wanted to get rid of me, probably. They gave me to Sears, where I had all these radical ideas with Sears. Right, to, to hire a woman to buy lingerie because a woman understood it better than a man. Yeah. In other words, you people, I would say, you people claim to be for the capitalist system. Now, I'm the only person here from east of Ohio. So I don't really see the world the way you do, which, by the way, was true. And certainly, my name did never help me there. Yeah. My name was Herbert Cohen. I told, I would say things like, my real name is J. Wellington Cartwright III, which I changed for business purposes to Herbert Cohen. As you can tell by my speech pattern, I was born and raised in Cheyenne, Wyoming, often at a young age adopted by Vietnamese boat people. And early on, they moved me to a neighborhood called Bensoner. So, so, so now, it, it, they said, hey, look, it's enough time. You then end up, I mean, this is Herbert Cohn ends up at IBM? Yeah. As associate corporate counsel? Yeah. I mean, I, I realized you went to law school, but you hadn't been practicing law. No. So what were you doing for IBM? Well, I was uh, like speaking at their programs. Mostly I was doing uh, uh, like stuff. Uh, they had a training program at Glen Cove in those days. Then they had for their top executives at Sands Point. I would be the closing speaker at those programs where I would give all my, you know, ideas about the way you ought to run a business and manage people. Then they actually moved to Armonk, and uh, uh, oh, before that they were in Southbury, Connecticut. I was in all these places. Now, the family was where at this time? The family was still in Illinois, which meant I was traveling all the time. Now, you had a job, you had insurance, you had stability, and one day you wake up and you say, I'm giving this up and I'm just going to become a negotiator. How'd yeah. that happen? Well, I actually had a, was working at the University of Michigan's Graduate School of Business. And I was teaching there, I was on the faculty. And uh, I liked doing that a lot. In fact, I didn't really make a lot of money doing that because just getting there, sometimes I would have to charter a plane or I always take a plane to go to Detroit and then Detroit Metro and then go to Ann Arbor. And uh, people wanted to get me uh, into their companies. You know, people showed interest in me. Uh, leave what you're doing and, you know, come to work for us. So I said, you know, I could become a consultant. I could get out there and, you know, uh, use the University of Michigan as a base, which I did. And I was young then, and I was a big risk taker, and I was strong on adventure, not doing the same thing over and over again. And um, so. So it's 1970. Um, you go out, and I was reading in one of the books uh, or one of the articles, you decide to charge a price of like $3,700 to negotiate. How do you determine what you were gonna charge? Uh, I charged what I thought was reasonable. In fact, uh, I probably wasn't charging enough. My wife got involved in my business because my kids got a little older and she didn't want me to work so much. So she doubled my fee. I got more business. Now. One of the interesting things that you talk about in negotiation is the toughest negotiation is with kids. 
with kids and grandkids. Tell me about that, especially since you have 10 grandkids yeah. and you have three children. Well, because one of the most difficult things in negotiation is when you become emotionally involved. In other words, if you're thinking of purchasing something, rule one is never fall in love with the item you're trying to buy, whether it be a, a home or a car. In other words, fall in like. As I say, care, but not that much. And so with children, negotiation is not a game. That's screwing up. Now, in, in the first book that you wrote in 1980, that, that you can negotiate anything, you talk about you come back from a trip one day and you go to this restaurant and your third son, Rich, okay, didn't like eating. He was weighed like 50 pounds. You know, he was this small little kid. And you say, sit at the table. And he says, no, I'm sitting underneath the table. Yes. So what do you mean, what happened on this? Well, Master negotiator. It's a true story. We would be, first, we would do what all parents do, plead with them rich. We would be embarrassed. Everyone would be, especially my wife, everyone looking at us, we have to leave. The kid's humiliating the family. And then, and then you try threatening them, physical force. And finally, to be honest with you, what we did with Rich was each person would leave the table, go outside with him while he, like, pitched rocks. We couldn't take him into restaurants anymore. The kid was a menace. I mean, we weren't used to this. We were used to using desserts to bribe children. You know, if you're good, you could order the Sunday. He didn't want a Sunday. He, he didn't, didn't want to eat. He didn't like eating. Right. Yeah. So, now, now very, another interesting thing, which even today, because I think I read in, in 2010 or 2011, you, you know, people negotiate a car. You know, there's a sticker price, and I, I think your, your favorite, I mean, I don't know if I could go to a store with you, because I think you negotiate on everything, <laughs> <laughs> nearly everything. I mean, you talk about the wearing down the person. You know, it's like the two hours, okay? You go in there, uh, two great stories. You know, one is, you know, is the refrigerator, you know, you know the price, but you know, I never saw that people negotiate the price. You say the guy has two hours invested in you, then you come back the following week, another two, week, two hours, finally six hours. He's wasted so much money, he's worth money. But th I think the, the great story is the story of the, the, the tailor, of buying the suit at the tailor. You, you spend three hours looking at the sales, and then you say, then there's this little, you know, the little tailor, you know, now they, they've replaced them, you know, who's chalking up on the things over here, and, you know, he's ready to do this, and you're ready, you know, the guy's wasted six hours on this $320 suit anyway, and you say to the guy, can't you throw in the tie? Can't you throw in the $7 tie? I mean, uh, but I think these two stories lead because you've been involved with Iran. You, you've, you've, you tell me some of the stories with the presidents. I mean, you work with Carter, Reagan. I mean, you know, I think one of the stories in, in the second book is, did you ever see Clinton's body? You always say you always saw his head, but you never saw his body, okay? What were you doing for the government? I mean, you worked with the FBI for 35 years. I mean, your military career, they should have had you on the list of the most wanted FBI. So what were you doing with them? Well, what I was... Uh, I was teaching for the FBI in, you know, in every virtually executive program they ever had. At the, I used to teach at the National Executive Institute, uh, and I did this for 35 years. And also, I was involved in the hostage negotiating program. A lot of my crazy ideas, uh, you know, today are accepted throughout the world. I was just in with the RCMP in Edmonton, Canada, and they're quoting back to me things that I like made up, you know, like how do you deal with a hostage taker, you know, uh, how, how people should dress. As you could tell, I'm not a big believer in dressing for success. Right, but you, I mean, you talk about negotiation. You were talking about in one of the articles I read, maybe from the 700 Club or something, or the other one, talking about you can't, you can't negotiate with an irrational person. 
I think Saddam Hussein was one of the stories that you... Yeah, uh, no, uh, the, the hardest person to negotiate with is one, a crazy person, the second, irrational, and the third is dumb. So I'm saying uh, one of the things, you, and by the way, all these people aren't crazy. You know, Saddam Hussein, when he moved into Kuwait, that wasn't crazy. That was like a very good strategic move on his behalf. It met his needs. In fact, I gave a whole big dissertation uh, in Sydney, Australia, you know, about why he did it. And We had the Carter and then the Reagan administration on the hostages. I mean... Yeah. No, uh, with the hostage situation... Uh, what happened was, uh, everyone recalls or, or heard about, November 1979, a horde of Iranian students climbed over the wall in the American embassy in Tehran and took, at the beginning, like 400 hostages. Ultimately, that number came down to 52. Uh, the Carter administration, their initial strategy was, uh, they asked the American people to light a candle, to pray every day for the hostages, and to tie a yellow ribbon around preferably an oak tree. Uh, the only effect that this had on the situation it made a lot of money for... Uh, the record company. <laughs> for Kenny Rogers. For Tony Orlando and Dawn, okay? And so they were so desperate they called me in and... Uh, I got called in because of my experience with the FBI. I had been in Iran. I knew the difference between uh, a Shiite and a Sunni, between, uh, you know, an Arab and a Persian. Uh, I had met Ayatollah Beheshti, who was then head of the Islamic Republican Party, and they were desperate. And so I met with President Carter and Cyrus Vance at the White House. And I tried to explain to them that what they were doing wouldn't work. Uh, I said, look, uh, the basic situation is you're dealing with people who look at this differently than we do. How do Americans feel about negotiations? We don't even like the word. My wife calls it haggling, chiseling. Has even said to me on many an occasion, I do not lie for money. The implication is that I do. But the Iranians bargain everything. I mean, if you think of your own experience. Have you ever purchased a Persian rug retail? If you wanted to, they wouldn't let Wait you. Wait a second. You know, this relates to a story that you are in Mexico City with a Serapi. Yeah. I think it's 2,000 pesos. <laughs> And you think that the great mess negotiator, the person goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I have this story because we were in Taos, my wife and I, on this, on this focaccia uh, pitcher. And, you know, negotiate, Gomez, uh, Hortez says, come back, come back. We come back. Okay. And then I go into the next town over. I see I could have bought it for less. Now, you negotiate the Serapi price down to 200 pesos. You get home to see Ellen, and you tell her how great you are at 200 pesos. And she says to you, hey, big boy, I paid 175, and I didn't even negotiate, right? Right. Okay. Well, you know, the, the point of the Serapi story is everybody has got a Serapi somewhere, you know, uh, that they don't use. Why the hell do we buy a Serapi? It's the process, and uh, that's true with the process of negotiation. And so if you go back to, I'm um, with Carter, see, I try to explain to him, the Iranians believe in negotiations we don't. Uh, and the Carter cuts me short and says, Herb, you, myself, and the Mullahs, we all from the same Abrahamic tradition. I didn't even know what he was talking about, you know. Uh, but I figured he and I may have been from that tradition, but not the mullahs. I go on. I say to Carter, what is, uh, you know, the uh, uh, largest purchase a person makes in our culture? And the answer is like a home. Okay. How do we know what to pay for this new home? We look at the sign in the sky which says... Uh, $354,000. That's what we pay. And we do it fast. Why? Because time is money. How about the Iranians? Okay. 
First of all, they bargain everything, okay? And then again, uh, they take time, because if you're a mullah, and we're dealing with the Iranian mullahs, uh, these people, other than their obligatory five prayers five times a day, they're looking to kill time. So we're coming from a different place. With, with limited time, we got to talk about the three joys of your life and your grandchildren. You have three children. Tell me about your daughter and your two sons. Well, uh, my daughter is uh, someone that surprised her parents because she's very successful. She's also a very wonderful... She's a federal prosecutor? She's a federal prosecutor in the Southern District of New York, and she's had that job for a long time. Uh, her brother was also a federal prosecutor, and then... Your daughter's name is... You have to remember the names. My daughter? Yeah. Her name is uh, Sharon. Right. And then there's... Steve. Steve. Steve was formerly a federal prosecutor, and then he was the chief of staff for Andrew Cuomo when he was the attorney for, general. Right, right. And then he was... His chief of staff when he was the, the no, governor. No, he was the secretary. Secretary, and then over there, he's very was very involved with the gay uh, gay marriage. Yes, Andrew gave him that assignment. Right. I read about that in the New York Times. You see, it's always based to read the so, New York no. Times. <laughs> Come to think of it, you pointed out to me New York Times is the center of my life. Right. Okay. So so that's Stephen, and, and then you have. Somebody who didn't want to keep his name Richard, you have Rich. The, Rich. One who, the, one, the one who was the troublemaker. The one who was the troublemaker became the author. He became the storyteller. Well, Rich did not want to go to law school. And by the way, <laughs> I'm overly involved with children to the point where everyone says I'm crazy. Um, I applied to college. Uh, I applied to graduate school for Rich. Who didn't want to go to graduate school? I applied to 23 graduate schools for him. He was rejected from 22 for English because he wanted to be a writer. And uh, he didn't know he applied. After about 10 rejections, people would make fun of him in his dorm and say, hey, Rich, you're not a rejection. He figured it out, you know, and he called home. And Rich has written like eight novels and yeah, well, a screenplay. Since then, but uh, at the time, he wasn't used to rejection. I got him used to rejection. Now, Sharon's married to who? Sharon is married to Bill Levin. And they have how many children? Four children. And the names of the four children? Oh, listen, if I screw this up. <laughs> You're in trouble, <laughs> Papa. I'm in big trouble. Um, is Matt, Matt, David, uh, Emma, and Hannah. Okay, and Stephen is married to? Lisa. And Lisa, they have? And they have three children. And they have Elias, uh, Ethan, and Madeline. And then Rich. Rich? Rich has three children, and their names are Aaron, Nate, and Micah. Micah named after Morris. Morris. All of my children named a child after my father. So I got to say, you know, I do a lot of interesting people, and you have definitely been an interesting person, and I think reading your books, I gained a number of insights, like how to be a caller, caller, and a win-win, and I'd like to thank you for being here today. Well, thank you for having me.